as a new congressman, Joe took the lead in sounding the call for, the tr for truth in federal budgeting, accounting, and reporting, and in bringing financial accountability to Washington. He was the original author of the Chief Financial Officer Act, which was signed by President George Bush in 1990. The act mandated the assignment of a chief financial officer to each major department and agency of the United States government. Since leaving the Congress in 1989, Joe has established a nonpartisan program, Truth in Government, through which he continues to crusade for fiscal and accounting reforms. The author of Unaccountable Congress, it doesn't add up, and I think he's brought these books with him today. Yep. Joe is a frequent speaker on fiscal responsibility and public accountability. <clears throat> We're most grateful that Joe has taken time to be with, us, be with us today. His topic is sound budgeting, accounting, and financial reporting for the United States government. The time has come. Please join me in giving him a very warm rotary welcome, the Honorable Joe D. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Larry, and let me say hello to all my friends, fellow Rotarians. David, thank you, Larry, Andreas, and, and all fellow Rotarians. I see we have a guest from Turkey, and I'd like him to know that I, my wife and I have made many trips there uh, in our human rights capacity for the ethnic Albanian people in the Balkans, so merhaba in your language. We spoke at the University of Marmara in 1995, so, and I'm see, I see that our faithful ally Turkey is doing well these days. You know, I was a new congressman. What did I know about national security, spending all those years in Arthur Anderson? I was reading the Wall Street Journal, commuting from Scarsdale. Now you go to Congress and you have to know a lot. And I found out that Turkey had the longest border with the Soviet Union. That's why Reagan spent so much time with Turkey and the making sure that the military establishment there was good because they were our surrogate during the Cold War. You learn a lot when you go to Congress, except that, uh, how to balance the books. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. But I did bring, now, I was here last year. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> got an allergy, so every now and then I have to take a sip of water. I was here last year, and a lot's happened in a year. And I'll review that with you in a minute. But many of you may have gotten my book already, but feel free to take one for a friend. And this is kind of an update on the book. I think I passed out a version of this last year. Feel free to take another one. Uh, today, uh, over the weekend, I worked on an article that I hope the New York Times will publish because someone has got to light a fire under the Congress, under the administration, that it is not fair to pass on to the next generation the debt that we are doing. Not just the debt that you've heard about, the bonded debt, the 11 trillion, which is gonna go to 20 trillion, in the next 10 years admitted to by our president, uh, but what they're not recording, everything off the budget. Uh, you know, sooner or later, these things have to be paid, and we're burying them and figuring out someone else has got to do that. That's not fair to the next generation. But there are good signs, because if you read the papers these days, uh, you're seeing a lot about reform. In fact, I saw an article in a local paper just last week and while the headline is state senators, and you see that messy Senate we have, right? Uh, you know, leave tax reliefs for later. The byline is very important because it's something I've been talking about. Public authorities will face increased scrutiny. And you know what that means? Well, first of all, let me tell you, I thought there was only 600 authorities. There are 700. Someone corrected me last year and said, no, there's only 200. We have 700 public authorities. And guess what they basically are? slush funds for the politicians to put their friends in very expensive jobs like the Battery Park Authority. You lose an election, you go down there and you run it for a couple hundred thousand a year. You stay there three years, they multiply your pension by the highest average in the last three years, and, and you go to your retirement nicely. Hey, all the states seem to be doing something like this. It's not just the federal government. When are we gonna learn that money is finite? That sooner or later, you know, it's gotta be paid by somebody. And that's why I'm here to tell you, I'm gonna focus on the federal government, but I needed to make that case as well. So, it's been a year since you heard me speak. What a year this has been. Think about it. Since the last time I was here, I, mean, I think it was the fall, September, we were hot and heavy in the middle of a political election. We now have a new president. But look what's happened to the economy since that time. 
Look what's happened to the regulatory framework, the financial markets since that time. Look what happened, you know, this Treasury Secretary is now being uh, condemned, certainly blamed, for bailing out his friends. You know, his Lehman goes under, Goldman Sachs is whole, and yet, you know, a lot of money went to Goldman Sachs, AIG, to make them whole. Who made these decisions? Where's the oversight? Was it done fairly? We don't know. A lot of things are being questioned. The economy now seems to be, you know, in shambles. Certainly the unemployment rate keeps going up. The stock market went as low as 6,500. Now it's back to above 8,500. But no one really knows where we will stand next year. It's easy to tell you where we were last year, but where are we going to be next summer at this time? No one really knows. The volatility is a reflection of the lack of trust that people now have in our system. And it goes to the system of government, too. And the biggest problem we have is the issue that I'm going to talk about today. We certainly know that we don't live within our means. You know that. No one has attempted to balance the budget of the United States of America. And don't believe Clinton did it either. There were no surpluses. That was a big lie. Because we've had a game that's been played since Lyndon Johnson disguised the cost of the Vietnam War by coming up with something called a unified budget. He saw all these surpluses in the trust accounts, Social Security, Highway Trust Fund, and he said to himself, why should we have those surpluses when we have all these deficits in all the other operations of governments? Why can't we create a unified budget so we offset the deficit in all the other parts of government against these surpluses? And who created those surpluses? We did. Payroll taxes. Gasoline taxes. That money should have been segregated. Not only was it melded to reduce the deficit, they took it out and spent it on everything else. So that now, when Social Security, which is now obviously going to go bankrupt or close to it because the baby boomers are now entitled to what they put away for the last 50 years, we, we took $4 trillion out of those funds and spent it on other things. We put an IOU in there. It's called the Treasury Bill. Don't forget, out of the $11 trillion of bonded debt, what do I mean by bonded? Savings bonds, treasury notes, treasury bills, approximately four to five trillion is money that is not in the public's hands. It's in these trust funds because they took the money, they replaced it with a treasury bill, and they accrue interest, but they don't pay the interest out. So they get away with not having to raise the money now, but when do they need the money? When the people retire. Guess what? They're retiring now, the baby boomers. That money now has to be added on top of all the other expenses of government. This is basic, simple arithmetic, but nobody wants to understand it in Washington. We have in Washington the worst set of books you can imagine. It's called the cash basis of accounting. Now, isn't it ironic that the Securities and Exchange Commission requires publicly traded corporations to have the most uh, how would you say? The most professional accounting standards. It's called generally accounting, generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP. What does that mean? That means that you have to record not only what you're spending, you have to record your commitments to spend. If you're a shareholder, you want to know not just what cash flow is, because you can manipulate very easily cash flow by deferring expenses, accelerating income. But you want to know what is that corporation's responsibility to pay in the future on commitments they made today? And what is their right to receive money? Because they may have receivables. They may have assets that haven't been reduced to cash, but they have the right to receive that. That's called the accrual basis of accounting. Every certified public accountant knows that's the only way to keep books if you're protecting someone else's money. Now, what does the SEC do? It protects shareholders. When are we going to protect taxpayers? They use a separate accounting system in the Congress for the budget system and for the reporting system, mainly the budget system, cash basis. Now, how do you protect taxpayers 
when you don't really tell them what the real national debt is. And what are the gimmicks? Gimmick number one on the budget process, the unified budget, should be changed immediately. I know it's going to be bad news. That's why they don't do it. Nobody, no politician wants to give you bad news on their watch, unless it's some kind of an emergency or it's fully disclosed and they can't get away with it. But this is not fair to offset the deficits in all of the operations of government against the trust fund money. Does anyone in this room think that's fair? It's outrageous. Not only is it not fair, it is, it's created the potential for the biggest Ponzi scheme in history because we're stealing from the next generation to consume today. Worse than that, money has been set aside that has been used. We're not talking about just raising taxes. The money has been taken already, and in effect, this is now raising taxes on the next generation. But doesn't that generation need capital and need money to face all the problems that it has in those days? So, you know, we got a lot of problems. The accounting system, no good. The budget system is broken in so many ways. Number one, we got the unified budget. Number two, we have things off the books. The biggest example, when I was in Congress, I couldn't believe they were doing it. I didn't know that, it, you know, I was a CPA in the private sector. I didn't know you can get away with this. That's why I put the bill in for a chief financial officer. And thank God, I mean, it wasn't easy as a junior member of the minority party. You can imagine the energy I had to bring to this to finally get a bill on the floor and it was passed a year after I left, take the article with my picture on it. That picture was from 25 years ago when I first introduced it in 1986. This is the 20th year coming up. I just spoke in New Orleans in front of the Association of Government Accountants and someone was nice enough to remind the 2,000 people there we had with us, former Congressman Joe DiAguardi, I spoke in another session, by the way, uh, a CPA, and guess what? We, next year is the 20th anniversary of the bill he put in, and it has saved billions and billions of dollars. But you know what? It's not enough. That was just one little idea. We need bigger ideas, and I'm gonna tell you what they are. But the issue is, the budget process is broken, and the biggest example in 1987 was the SNL bailout. That bailout, much like what just happened with the stimulus bill, cost us $500 billion. They played every trick in the book until we got to the point where it couldn't be disguised, including coming up with something called RAP accounting, regulated accounting principles, so those SNLs, by the way, those are commercial loans, savings and loan, not association. The big problem we've had recently has been with the mortgages, private, but now we see that there could be other problems too. But when you think about it, they came up with a euphemism, in my mind, regulated accounting principles, so you could pretty much pick any accounting system you want to value the asset so you didn't have to record on the books the real losses until the game was over and then we had the bailout. It cost you $500 billion. Now, did they put that into deficit? No. Congress passed a special bill that that be done off budget. Did you have to raise uh, uh, the money anyway? Yes. We added it to the national debt by selling treasury bills. You need the money. So here, what the private sector never does. Private sector CPAs have a rule. It, it, it changed right after World War II. That you can't put anything in retained earnings. Or, or you can't do anything unless it goes through the profit and loss statement. They used to have uh, a gimmick putting it through as a surplus adjustment. In other words, we bypass the annual profit and loss statement and put it in through surplus so no one really sees it. This is what the, that's no longer legal in accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. But the government, in effect, is doing that because when big things have to be done and they don't want the public to know the cost, what they do is they float the bonds to pay it, but they don't throw it, put it through the budget deficit, which is what we focus on every year. Okay, so here's the national debt going up, but it's not the sum total of the deficits. The deficits are always less than the national debt for that reason. That should not be. So we've got that kind of thing. You've got, I just mentioned authorities to you. 700 authorities that are off the books in New York State. The good part of this bill that Brodsky, and by the way, he's a liberal Democrat. I'm considered a Republican, a fiscal conservative. I called him to say God bless you about three weeks ago when he put that in. 
I said, you're doing the right thing, and, and keep, keep it up. Now, what is he doing? They're coming up with an oversight authority to look at the budgets. Would you believe these 700 authorities had not had even the controller of the state approving their budgets? This is a, you know, a perfect reason for politicians to have a field day. And that's what they've been doing. And we still don't know the cost of that. But guess what? If one of those authorities has a deficit, like the MTA, guess where they get the money? They have to float bonds. Guess who stands behind those bonds? New York State. Shouldn't we then be involved up front to know what these budgets are before you pull the, put the full faith and credit of the United States? Now segue to Washington. Same thing going on. We don't call them authorities. You know what you call them? Government-sponsored enterprises. There are 29 of them, starting with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the post office, uh, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, the farm credit system, 29 off the books, off the budget. Where's the oversight authority on these? And believe me, a lot of political appointments go into these uh, uh, GSEs, friends. Who's to know they're being put there because they're, you know, big contributors? We gotta start separating, you know, that political system from the real numbers. And that's basically what I wrote in an article that Shirley and I sent to the New York Times today. They're gonna say, they're gonna reject it, First of all, they're going to say it's too long, but I'm prepared to shorten it. But I wanted someone to get an education. I changed this article five times so they can get the education, knowing they're going to say, no, it's too long. That's their first excuse. I don't know what their second excuse is yet. But, uh, but they're starting to publicize some interesting articles. In fact, uh, today's editorial, Shirley cut out for me. She reads the Times, I read the, the, the Wall Street Journal, and we share articles. But this was today in the uh, editorial, I guess it was the second one. Shock circle in Congress. Let me read it to you. This is kind of good for us. The banking industry has made no secret of its desire to kill off President Obama's timely and important proposal to create a powerful new consumer protection agency. It's counting on the cooperation of lawmakers addicted to campaign contributions and eager to please their patrons. How nice. But there are other sharks in the water. The administration must also fend off federal regulators who far too often have placed the bankers' interests first and consumer protection second and want to preserve the status quo. That's the problem. Everybody wants to preserve the status quo. But let me tell you, in the area that I'm talking about right now, uh, the game is gonna be over soon. Why? Public concern. Did you read the Zogby poll two weeks ago? All of a sudden, the public is now more concerned about the deficit and the national debt than they are about the economy. Have you been reading this? This is good news. Because now, you know, and there's enough economic pain, you would think no one's forgetting that economic pain, but now they realize what they're listening to coming out of the Obama administration is, is never gonna add up. For instance, and this is the numbers that the o Office of Management and Budget, which is the president speaking, or Orzog, he's what he's saying, that right now the budget, the annual debt, the national debt, at the end of this fiscal year, which will be September 30th, 2009, will exceed $11 trillion, okay? Uh, they're adding a trillion seven hundred billion just in one year. We don't know the final numbers. But they're preparing us that in the next 10 years, it's gonna raise, it's gonna rise approximately, think of these numbers, $10 trillion. That's $21 trillion. Now let's look at that, and by the way, it has nothing to do with what's off the books. Nothing to do with the reforms I told you. This is cold, hard cash. This is the bonds that we have to sell and disguising everything else. And what do you think is one of the big ones we're disguising? The liability for Social Security and Medicare has been advertised. Look at the papers, the Pete Peterson Foundation, the former Controller General, David Walker. He'll give you the number, $53 trillion. That's off the books. That's what we are indebted to today for everybody alive that's contributed, working, that we need to pay at some point. Unless we're ready to walk away from that. And believe it or not, there are people in Washington, I testified in front of the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, the agency that my bill created, but I thought it was gonna be an independent agency. Guess who funds it? The Treasury Department, Congress, uh, and two other governmental agencies. So, in effect, 
they're not independent. They have a conflict. But what, what they're saying is that no matter what, we expect to raise this debt $10 trillion. Now, the simple arithmetic is that if interest rates are now 4%, how can interest rates stay near 4% if the Fed's going to flood the place with money as they're doing right now? That's monetary policy. And fiscal policy is going to keep borrowing. They're going to tax some, but they're going to keep borrowing mainly. Wouldn't you think that would drive up inflation? And isn't interest a function of what inflation is? Usually two points above inflation. Remember Jimmy Carter, 1980? Remember the pain? 20% or 21% prime rate of interest. The inflation rate was 19%. That could happen again. That would be such a disaster in terms of people who have savings and public pensions and things like that. But this could happen. But even if you kept the interest rate down to 5%, what is 5% of $20 trillion? It's a trillion dollars. That would mean in 10 years, at the lowest possible estimate, the interest on the national debt will start pushing out other government programs. Now, who's going to bail out America? China? China's already questioning whether or not they've lent us too much money. Now we're a hostage to Saudi Arabia for oil and China for money. These are two countries that don't share our values. Did you see Hillary Clinton when she went to China? Did she say anything about Tibet? Anything about Tiananmen Square? All of a sudden, our mouth is closed about human rights because we need their money. Is this the kind of country we want to pass on to the next generation? I, I hesitate to think that it is. Now, what's the answer? The answer is you. The answer is an informed citizenry. Now, my challenge in my piece today to the Times is to CPAs, financial managers, controllers, because they are the informed citizens that know that this system is wrong. And they've got to now speak, not in their jobs, but as citizens. They've got to rise up. I feel like Thomas Paine now during the <laughs> revolution. But I'm speaking to the, uh, not the soldiers, I'm speaking to the accountants and the CPAs and the financial managements and the government accountants. I almost feel like we need what Gandhi did, some kind of a boycott. Can you imagine if all the accountants stopped counting? <laughs> Somebody would have to change something, right? Gandhi said, don't buy the uh, cotton anymore from England. Something changed. Martin Luther King said, don't go on that bus with Rosa Parks. Something changed. Are we ready to inflict some pain where it belongs? Are we ready to share that pain? Are we ready to stand up as citizens because the next generation is going to pay for this? Now, the answers to me are very simple. The basic answer, really, the founding fathers missed. In the Constitution, there should have been a requirement for a balanced budget. And we've been trying to pass a balanced budget amendment. We came close in 1994 when the Republicans took control for a while. We were two states short of the two thirds. They got 32 states, we needed 34. So there wasn't a convention convened. Some people were worried if you convene a convention, how do you know there's, not, there's gonna be a lot of other nonsense we gotta deal with. But frankly, we, we, we gotta deal with this issue. So the answer to me, very simply, and the bottom line of this article, is it's time to take numbers away from politicians. We need to create a separate agency like the Fed. Now I know people in this room have problems with that, They'd like to see the Fed go away too, but at least monetary policy has an independent air to it. People are screaming right now that they want to audit the Fed, believe it or not. Ron Paul comes up with a bill, let's audit the Fed, and everybody's taking a front at that, oh, we can't interfere with the Fed. But what about fiscal policy? Shouldn't we have an independent, if not a branch, something like the Fed, so that numbers are taken away from politicians? Do I mean the political process of appropriations, authorization, no, that has to be allocated politically. You elect representatives for that. But once they do that, they should stand aside and let professional accountants independent to use the right accounting system, the right budget system, including all the money we're spending and all the commitments we're making to spend in, as part of the budget system, not just the reporting system. And a reporting system 
that doesn't give you 110 pages like I just read, issued by the Treasury Department, but the annual report of the United States of America. Doesn't include, by the way, a liability for Social Security. They dumbed it down in many ways. It's kind of a hybrid thing. But who's going to read 110 pages except someone like me before I have to give a speech to make sure that I didn't miss something? All right? So we got all kinds of problems that we've got to change. And the answer is, in this short time, and I know I've overstayed my leave here, is to take numbers away from the politicians. Only you can do that. I hope you take my books with you. And if you have any questions, I'd love to take them. Thank you for such a great speech. We always love your coming here. Um, a few weeks ago, I don't know, a month ago, we had a speaker here who is working with Mr. Peterson, who used to be the head of the Blackstone Group. David Warner. David Warner. Yeah, he's a former, he's a former partner of mine from Arthur Anderson. And, and, and a good and man. he seems to be right down your alley. Absolutely. And you and him should join hands. I mean, why are you separate? You we two testified two. together before the Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Board. He's the foundation that took out a two-page ad in the Times yeah. saying that the debt is $53 trillion, but believe it or not, we differ on something. Would you believe that he doesn't believe that the liability should be recorded on the books for Social Security? He's buying the idea of this conflicted board that, since the Social Security law says that if we run out of money, there's no obligation to pay, then why should it be a liability? Arthur Anderson didn't say that when we prepared that statement the first time. We said no. People have been elected on the fact that a lock box has been advertised and, and, and all kinds of, uh, you, you know, uh, things to say that your money is protected. You cannot say that's not a liability. So we have a little difference. But he's the best man you can have in that position. I only wish he stayed where he was. You know, he was there for another five years. We needed him in government. We didn't need him in the Pete Peterson Foundation. I don't think, but he's, he's you can be sure I'll work with him. He's doing a great campaign, and if you sign up in his website, you will get things Good. done. So maybe you and him can work together. We're gonna, great idea. I like that. Okay, you've given me a challenge. I gave you one, but he gave me one. Okay. Shirley and I on the way down, we called the office of Congressman Frank Wolf, Virginia. Why? About a month ago, he put out to his constituency, and he sent me a nice note, because he knows I'm doing these things. I speak at things that he attends to say, Joe, I'm, I'm trying to do something. He started something called SAFE. I forget what the acronym means, but it basically means that we need to change the budget process. So I want to meet with him, and I just called his scheduler, set up a meeting on Thursday, to see if we can start in Congress a caucus for accountability and get those members. We do have a CPA in Congress right now, uh, Mike Conaway from Texas, and there's probably a couple of more. But did you see the article uh, in the Times yesterday? There are 18 doctors in the House and Senate. I don't think there are two or three accountants today. And I don't think any of them came out of the profession like I did. So there's not much interest. So we have to figure out how to create, and there was another article in the Times that there are over 300 caucuses today. And some of them are you know, the wine caucus, the bicycle caucus, and there's a human rights caucus now named after our great hero, Tom Lantos, who helped me and Shirley so much in the Balkans with the human rights issues. But there's not an accountability caucus. And this is very important. So I'm going to hopefully meet with Congressman Cooper of Tennessee, Congressman Conaway of Texas, and Frank Wolf to see how we can get the three of them to lead the way in Congress. And I'll be their shill outside of Congress trying to organize the American Association of Accountants, the Association of Government Accountants, the Institute of Management Accountants, New York State Society of CPAs, and the American Institute of CPAs, and there's a lot of other alphabet super accounting groups to bring them together to see if we can form a grassroots lobby and march on Washington. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. Okay, that's what I want to hear.